Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Amanda Shi. I'm an anesthesiologist and intensivist. And today I wanna to talk about money. Specifically, is it worth it financially to become a doctor? As many of you may already know, becoming a doctor is pretty expensive from a time perspective and from a financial perspective. On average, medical students graduate medical school with $170,000 in loans because medical schools are expensive. Tuition frequently is about 37,000 a year for a public medical school and sometimes at the higher end of $70,000 for tuition to go to medical school. So if you add it up, it's four years of 30 to $70,000 a year, you're looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars of debt. On top of that, interest compounding typically works against you in that situation because you are just accruing more debt while making no money while in medical school. A little background on me, I actually have my engineering degree. I have a bachelor's and I have a master's in biomedical engineering. So I've always wondered, what if I just became an engineer instead of a doctor? Would I be doing financially better at this stage in my life, in my 30s, or, would, or am I doing better as a doctor right now? Back in 2015, I actually wrote an article entitled, Don't Go Into Medicine for the Money, and I did a similar type of calculation back then. Back then, I made different assumptions than I'm gonna be making in this video, so if you wanted to check that article out, it is linked down in the description, so definitely check it out. For today's video, I'm going to do a more realistic setup of my personal specialty as well as a comparison to a primary care specialty, which is typically on the lower end of the salary pay. Let's start with the assumptions I made before I dive into some of the calculations, what that looks like, and at what age do you end up breaking even in terms of the difference in total net worth over time. So I make a lot of assumptions because you have to at this point. Um, first and foremost, in terms of salaries, I picked up average salaries from the ZipRecruiter website because it gave me an average salary for a biomedical engineer in Boston, as well as an anesthesiologist in Boston. And uh, my primary care comparison for an internist, I also pulled off the average income in Boston for an internist from ZipRecruiter. So that's where I got some of my base numbers, just because those are numbers that are readily available and are consistent across a single platform. I will say that my actual salary as an anesthesiologist is not as much as is listed in the ZipRecruiter assumption. So I'm just going to put that out there. But again, this is an average, so I didn't want this to be just my situation. I wanted it to be applicable a kind of more broadly or generally. Another assumption I made was that both the comparison would have no undergraduate loans. So me graduating as an engineer, I'm going to make the assumption that I got a ton of scholarships and was able to work through college and thus had no debt from college, just to make it a cleaner comparison. So that means that the engineer is gonna go out into practice, into their job, their first job, at the age of 23. I said 23 because I actually got my master's, so I'm gonna say it's one extra year of graduate school training. We'll again assume that you didn't have any loans from doing that. I start at age 23, uh, and then the other things that I have made an assumption for are uh, expenses. So in terms of Boston, I'm gonna make the assumption that the engineer and the doctor are both gonna be living in Boston. They're gonna be doing everything in this area that their living expenses are equivalent. So I made the living expenses $4,000 a month, which is $48,000 a year as a living expense thing. I think that that's kind of middle of the road. You know, someone can save a lot more money on their rent but typically rent living in the city of Boston is around $2,000 for a one bedroom. By sharing, you can get that lower. Uh, however, that being said, you know, we'll just go with the $2,000 for rent and then $2,000 for other miscellaneous expenses. You know, the phone bill, the internet bill, the Netflix account, uh, any other kinds of 
outings, so food, restaurants, all of that within a $2,000 buffer. I think that that's a pretty reasonable standard of living. It's not very, very frugal, but it's also not a lavish way of living. So I went with that assumption for the entire time that I'm making the comparison. So I don't take into account the fact that many people, once they get a, a good salary, especially doctors, once they get their first good salary, oftentimes their lifestyle expands into that salary. And so they end up spending more money. I'm definitely guilty of that now. We're gonna assume that these comparison people uh, are only spending $4,000 a month. So $48,000 a year. I also looked up the federal tax rate. So, you know, whatever salary you're given, you're taxed federally. I did not incorporate any income tax from the state though. So federal tax rates range from 22% to 35%. That is in the calculation, uh, depending on the total salary. And then I also made assumptions about the interest rate that the individuals would get by saving their income. So I made the assumption that they would make 5% every year and it would compound over each year. And then the last assumption I made was the resident physician stipend. So what I ended up doing was kind of averaging the total stipend across the four years because a resident stipend, at least within the hospital system I'm in and all the other hospital systems I've seen is typically increases with each PGY year. So within our hospital system that I'm working in, uh, the range goes from about 67,000 up to about 75,000. So I just said 70,000 to make it an even number. Okay, here's the spreadsheet. I'm gonna let you take a look at it on your own in terms of the details and some of the numbers and comparisons. Uh, but I did wanna highlight the three different scenarios that I kind of went over and, well, it's technically six different scenarios that I focused on in this spreadsheet. So first and foremost, I had put together this um, assumption about comparison of an engineer to an anesthesiologist. You know, the anesthesiologist goes to medical school. This was the person with no loans and a 5% interest rate return um, on savings. And in that situation, after four years of residency and going out into practice, uh, the anesthesiologist and the engineer uh, cross paths at age 32. Now, if the anesthesiologist had loans that they took out, they had compounding interest at 5% on their loans, which is actually quite low, usually interest is higher than that, uh, then it bumps up to age 34 in which they cross paths. Now, to compare this to someone in internal medicine or some of the other specialties that are historically not as well reimbursed, uh, what you'll see is that the benefit of internal medicine is that it's only a three-year residency, so you get an extra year of income and earnings. So you start making money at age 30, and the engineer and the internal medicine doc would then cross paths at age 33. If the IM doc had loans, however, um, then you find that it actually goes as far out as to age 38 before the paths or the savings um, and net worth actually cross. And then finally, I wanted to address some of the specialties that are historically underpaid. And so I took the bottom end of the zip recruiter uh, salaries for internal medicine to account for some of those specialties like pediatricians are all are known to be grossly underpaid for their value uh, and as a result what you'll see is that for someone with no loans they cross paths at age 35 but if someone had loans went into a lower paying specialty then they're looking at potentially all the way over to age 45 before their net worth is finally equivalent or beyond equivalent. People can argue that, oh, as long as you refinance and your interest rate is low enough, that's debt that you can pay off slowly and that's fine because you can, you know you'll be able to pay it off eventually. But the things that I wanted to throw into the mix when I thought about this particular discussion is the fact that I don't account for a lot of things in this comparison. So one is lost time. The medical student is spending their 20s studying 
doing clinical rotations, potentially doing 24 hour, 28 hour call on their clinical rotations. They're paying out money for their USMLE board exams. And in general, I'd say that medical school definitely had its highs and lows. There were definitely opportunities for me to get to know my classmates and be able to go out and enjoy my so-called 20s. But there was also a lot of stress involved with being in medical school. And that's time that I was, again, still in school rather than living the life of someone who is in a career and working a steady job. So there's that part. There's the other part of residency. So I would argue that residency actually takes some time off at the end of our life or takes time off of our total life expectancy because of the crazy hours. I mean, there were weeks that I worked over 100 hours a week because of, you know, the 28 hours to 34 hour calls I took as an intern, uh, as well as the really long string of nights. Sometimes I would do seven nights in a row in the ICU. You know, all of that really does add to breakdown and stress on your body. So that's not accounted for. Another thing that I wanted to bring up is that there is a higher risk of suicide among doctors. And even though I say, you know, at age whatever, 30 something, age 45, you know, you'll finally be able to meet the total income of someone who became an engineer. And again, these assumptions are such that both people, the engineer and the doctor, do not get any raises. They just get a steady income, right? So you could potentially, you have more income earning potential. However, I'm just for the sake of simplicity have assumed that it's the same salary. However, doctors actually have the highest suicide rate of any profession. In fact, the rate of suicide for doctors is about 28 to 40 people per 100,000, which is twice that of the general population, which is about 12 people per 100,000. So even though there's a potential for earning money and, and doing and being able to break even compared to someone else who is working a different profession, becoming a doctor puts you at higher risk for mental illness and for potentially and the level of stress that stress and devastation and destruction you may witness in the hospital may lead you to commit suicide. Now that is a cost I can't account for on an Excel sheet. And the final thing I wanna bring up too is that my colleagues that are engineers, typically they work a 40 hour work week. And if they have projects going on or a big deadline, they may increase the amount of work that they do over the course of the week, but they're compensated for that in terms of overtime and being able to be paid by the hour. Doctors aren't typically paid by the hour, typically their base salary or the number. So the number that I grabbed out of the ZipRecruiter website is usually inclusive of call. Most of the time, doctors don't have a salary that is just 40 hours a week, nine to five. That doesn't really exist within medicine. Uh, the places where it does exist, typically the pay is lower than what is being cited here, what's being shown here. And the reality is every single specialty has some work that you take home with you. Anesthesia, maybe not as much because after I have handed over a patient to another anesthesiologist, I have relinquished care of that patient to another physician. However, when I'm in the ICU, I will say, you know, I spend a good amount of time before I get into the hospital looking at my patients and thinking about them. You know, at night, I'm thinking about them constantly. I wonder if I should have done this. I wonder if I should have done that. Maybe they would benefit from this or that. I would look up papers. There's a lot of work that goes on between my set hours in the hospital. And that's something that if I were an engineer, I don't think I would be doing as much of. Yes, you know, if you're thinking about a project and you have a big deadline coming up, yeah, you'll definitely be thinking about things like that. But you know, my schedule right now as an attending includes call, that includes being in the hospital overnight for 14 hours for a couple times a month. My engineer colleagues aren't doing that. They're not staying up all night and having to respond to codes or other stressful situations. So there's an inherent difference there and there's an inherent downside to becoming a physician that 
can't be captured in an Excel sheet. What I wanted to close this video out with was this question of, is it worth it? I think it really depends on someone's situation going into medical school and their passion and if they feel like medicine is a calling that they actually want to be practicing it, that they really can't see themselves doing anything else. It's a relatively stable profession, though COVID has actually demonstrated that it's not as stable as we thought. I know a number of residents who had their contracts withdrawn or canceled prior to trying after they in the midst of covid something that we didn't expect was that volume in the emergency rooms actually went down because people were scared to come in because of the pandemic and so some jobs for emergency medicine residents actually are harder to come by a lot of hospitals lost a lot of money in the midst of the pandemic because they haven't been able to do as many surgeries, which is what generates revenue. So many hospitals and medical systems have really clamped down and frozen any kind of hiring, which makes it hard for residents coming out right now. And so while there are definitely, there's definitely some stability to the job, there's also other things that are not factored in there. And I also know that there are situations in which people have picked the wrong specialty. They go into residency and they realize um, close to the end of the residency that maybe they didn't really enjoy doing that work. And work ends up being harder because of that. You know, it's hard to be able to go in and do anesthesia or round in the ICU if you don't love what you do. So it may end up being worse by, someone may end up faring worse by doing medicine if they don't feel passionate about it. It also leads to the point that medicine is a career for the rich. I'm just gonna put it out there. It benefits people who have resources to be able to pay for medical school because the assumptions I made really don't reflect someone who needs to take loans out in order to go to college who needs to go to a really expensive medical school because they didn't get an acceptance anywhere else. Some people are coming out with $300,000, $400,000 of loans. And even at this higher, higher salary, they're looking at not really saving or catching up with their counterparts or their peers in other professional positions until 40s, 50s, maybe even close to retirement age. And those are things I think are important to consider is that there is inherent stress with having and carrying that much in loans and knowing that you're actually worth, you have a net worth of negative for much of your life. You know, it's hard to be able to see your colleagues and peers that go into other professions, be able to buy a house, buy a car, start a family while you are drowning in debt. Now, I hope that this video was helpful. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question of whether it's financially worth it to go into medicine. Let me know what you think in the comments. Give this video a like if you felt like it was helpful or interesting and subscribe to my channel if you want more videos from me. I'll see you guys next time.